Praise the Lord. I thought you would say good answer. Praise the Lord. Why don't you rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you because you brought us to a glorious time, a wonderful time. Every time we spend in your presence, it's a great time, glorious time. Lord, we pray at this time that you reach out to every heart and life and you teach us your mind and your revelation and your will in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that these words will fall, upon, will fall on fertile ground and we will receive your word and your word will do good in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Be glorified in our Bible study tonight. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our study today, we come to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7 is what is referred to as Christ's Sermon on the Mount. And actually, as you look at the whole chapter or the whole passage, that is chapters 5, 6, and 7, you'll find they're divided into various sections. And the first section is what we're looking at today. The first section in the sermon is referred to as the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. That word, Beatitudes, means great happiness or great blessedness. So anytime you hear the Beatitudes, we're talking about the great blessedness or we're talking about the great happiness. And actually, as you look at the first 10, at the first 10, 12 verses, actually reading from verse 3, you'll see how the Lord said over and over, blessed, blessed, blessed. And here the Lord is describing for us the path to great happiness. Look at your Bible now in Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst at righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say, All manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, rejoice, he says, and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. As you look at the next part from verse 13, if you have a Bible that divides into various paragraphs, you'll see there's a sign. All right, from that verse 13, that sign shows this another paragraph. Therefore, you have a section here from verse 3 to verse 12, telling you about the path and the road and the way and the ladder to blessedness or to great happiness. You see that Jesus started his ministry. And as he started his ministry, he started describing the blessedness of the way of the Lord. And he says, blessed, blessed, blessed. What a great challenge for you and for me, especially those of us who are preachers. Maybe you're a preacher, you're a pastor, you're an overseer. And you're just taking over a new region, a new stage, a new nation. And you come to the people. We learn from the Lord Jesus Christ. Your first appearance before the people of God, before the church of God, you do not preach a hard sermon, a serious sermon, a sermon that will make a person almost say, uh uh, this new pastor is going to give us a great time. This is born to you. But you start with the blessedness and the happiness. What's the way to the happiness of the kingdom of God? What is the way into the joy, the enjoyment of the experiences we have in the Lord? Or maybe you are not even an overseer taking over a new region, a new state, or a new nation. But you are called to a denomination. That's not your church. You just came to that church and for the first time you are preaching to them. How are you going to preach? You describe the blessedness of the way of the Lord. That's what we we learn from the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look at these beatitudes, this path to great happiness and to great joy and to great fulfillment in our lives, we're looking at verse 3 today. Blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Lord came to talk about the kingdom. And you'll find from the very beginning, he started emphasizing the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. He is the king. As you look at Matthew, actually, Matthew is talking about the king. He's talking about the king revealed. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? And then he now tells us, eventually as we go on in Matthew, he tells us about the king rejected. They rejected him. They will not have him. And then eventually he told them he's coming back again and he's going to reign. He's talking about the king returning. And then when he begins to reign as king of kings and the lord of lords, the king reigning. And so the, the Matthew is telling us about the king. He's revealed, rejected, returning, and then he's reigning. And now the king is talking about the kingdom. And he begins by telling us, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Actually, he has a key in his hand, the key to the kingdom. And as the king having the key in his hand, he says, I'm opening the door. Who am I going to open the door to? The people that are poor in spirit. He tells us at the very beginning of the sermon of the man that if you're going to get to the kingdom of God, here is the king standing there having the key in his hand and he's going to open the door and he tells us the kinds of people he's going to open the doors of the kingdom for. And he says that the people who are poor in spirit and open the door for them and invite them in because the kingdom belongs unto them. As the Lord begins his message by drawing the picture of blessedness, he tells us who is the blessed man. The path of blessedness as revealed by Christ is different from those from that path advocated by the people of the world. You see the people of the world, they, they don't think about the poor in spirit. And I'll explain to you later what that actually means. They do not think about the people that are low, the people that are meek, the people that are humble, the people that are peacemakers or the people that rejoice when they are persecuted. But the Lord Jesus Christ talks about the poor in the spirit. And these are the lowest in the wrong of the ladder. And the kingdom of God is, the very, is at the very highest. That means you bend low that you may go very high. He was teaching them that these are the people that are actually blessed. Those who are lowly. Those who are humble. And those who, are, those who will be exalted by the Lord himself. Now this is what he said on earth. Eventually Jesus went back to heaven. And when Jesus went back to heaven, then he sent a message down again. And we didn't know what he was talking about. He was talking about blessedness. Which means, when you come to the Lord, you are blessed. When you stay with the Lord, you are blessed. When you move on with the Lord, you are blessed. And eventually when you get to heaven, you are blessed. I'm looking at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, I'm looking at verse 3. Revelation chapter 1, reading from verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. See the Lord Jesus Christ speaking now from heaven. When he spoke on earth, blessedness. And now he's speaking from heaven, and it is still blessedness as well. Then we're looking at Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, that means yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Hey, would you, would you understand what I'm talking about? Here on earth, it describes the path of blessedness. And speaking from heaven, it's still talking about that path of blessedness. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and receive shame. You see what we are talking about? If you are a child of God and you have tasted of the blessing of the Lord, you become yourself a channel of the blessedness of the Lord, of the happiness of the Lord, of the goodness of God. On earth, he described the path to blessedness. And now talking from heaven, he's still describing the path to blessedness. Revelation chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 6. Revelation chapter 20, reading from verse 6. Blessed and holy. A seed that has part 
in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years till the past of blessedness. That is describing for us Revelation chapter, chapter 19 verse 8. Revelation chapter 19 verse 8. Then I'll come to verse 9. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed, clothed, in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And it says unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he says unto me, These are the true saints of God. Revelation 22, verse 7. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the saints of the prophecy of this book. Blessed is he that keepeth the saints of the prophecies of this book. And you'll find that obedience is linked to the path of blessedness. As you come to the Lord, the Lord is going to be showing you the path of obedience and the path of keeping the word of God and keeping to that word of God. Then you'll find the blessedness of the word that the Lord himself has promised. Then Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. In verse 14 it says, Blessed are they which do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. When he was on earth, he described the path to blessedness. And then when he went to heaven, he was still describing the same thing, the path to blessedness. And have you noticed what I read to you in that Revelation chapter 22? To have the way, to know the way, to know the path to the holy city, to the heavenly city. And what was he talking about in Matthew chapter 5? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Telling us about the same thing. That when you come to the Lord, he wants to show the way. He wants to show you the way to go to that heavenly city, that new Jerusalem. We come back now to Matthew chapter 5. And we're looking at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The word blessed, when you read other versions of the Bible, it means happy. Happy at the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven it means favored you are favored by god the grace of god brings the favor of god and the goodness of god and the blessing of god into your life and it says favored fortunate happy blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven i divide this study tonight to three parts as usual Point number one, meaningful perception of the poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? When Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, what does that mean? That's why I want to look at that point. Number one, meaningful perception of the poor in spirit. Number two, merciful promise to the poor in spirit. The promise that the Lord has made that if you are poor in spirit, if you are lowly, if you are humble, if you are meek, and if you lower yourself, you have a contrite heart, a repentant heart, a penitent heart. The promise that he has given, merciful promise for the poor in spirit. And then we have point number three, which is matchless provision. You cannot match this. This is the provision of the kingdom of God, matchless provision for the poor in spirit let's come back to number one as we come to number one we're looking at the meaningful perception of the poor in spirit read that again look at it as i read to you blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven who are the poor in spirit if you want to know what something is sometimes you have to be told what it is not therefore i'll first of all tell you what it is not poor in spirit number one it's not the poor in society not the poor in society you see there are many people in our society they're very very poor they're living below the poverty line they do not have enough to eat enough to wear and they do not have good accommodation and because they are poor in society sometimes if you listen to some of them they comfort themselves and they say well i'm suffering here on earth but jesus said Blessed are the poor. 
Then they don't read everything. They say, Jesus said, blessed are the poor. This is the kingdom of heaven. And when I get to heaven, because I'm poor in the society, I'm going to enjoy what I couldn't enjoy here. That see, if you're poor in spirit, it's not enough to just be poor in the society. You have to be poor in spirit. I'll show you that later. Number two, it does not mean poor in status. You see, there are poor, there are, there are people that are poor in social status. And when you need the people who are high in the land, wealthy in the land, and uh, they are forward in the land, and they have business, they have this, you cannot think about them. They are poor in their social status. And because of that, they think that, well, since I don't have any status here, when I get over there, when I die, I'm going to enjoy all the sufficiency and the splendor of heaven. It's the poor in spirit, not just because you are poor in status. Number three, there are people who are poor in substance. Substance. They do not have wherewithal to make ends meet. Maybe there's no job. Maybe there is no money. Maybe there is no accommodation. Maybe they don't have any property. Maybe they don't have any land. And they think that because we are poor in substance, we don't have anything. And Jesus said, blessed are the poor. No, the poor in spirit, not those who are poor in substance. Number four, there are some people who are poor and they are in slavery. They are poor and they are in slavery. Now, if you are if you are a musician and you have heard the Negro spirituals, Negro spirituals that just means the songs that those black Negroes, the black people in America, what they were singing, they were in slavery. And because they were in slavery, all of them thought many times, you know, already were suffering here. We're in slavery here. And because we're in slavery here, in servitude here, we're going to get to heaven when we die. In fact, some of their songs will reflect as if we are like the people of Israel. Let my people go. When you hear their songs, and it's like because we're poor and we're in slavery, then when we die, we're going to go to heaven. No, it's not because we're in slavery. It's not because we're in servitude. It's going to be because you're poor in spirit. Number five, there are people who are poor and sickly. They are poor and sickly. They don't have any health. They don't have any strength. And they go from hospital to hospital, from one sick bed to the sick bed to another sick bed. And they say, well, everything will end one day. They don't repent. And they're not born again. They're not children of God. They don't know about salvation, about conversion, about getting to heaven. Nothing about that. All they know is that I've suffered enough here. God will look at my suffering. And if he looks at my suffering, I've been sick. All my life, I've never been well. And because I've always been sick, I am poor and sickly. I don't have anything in my hand. I don't have any strength in my body. And because I'm poor and sickly, I'm going to get to heaven. My friend, it's more than that. It's more than that. It is only the people who are poor in spirit. Number, number six, not the people who are poor and sensual. Poor and sensual. You see, there are some people that live for the flesh. And they trade in the flesh. And they sell their body for fleshly things. And they say, well, God understands. We are poor. We love God. We love the word of God. What else can we do? If we're going to live on earth, if we're going to make ends meet, we have to do what we're doing. It's not that. If you're poor and sensual, that means you're using your flesh to commit sin. And that's what you're living for. That's what you're working for. Heaven does not come that way. Number seven, not the poor and sinful. The poor and sinful. There are people who are poor, but they're so wicked, they're so unrighteous, they're so sinful. In fact, they use their poverty as a reason for doing evil things. They say, God understands. We're still because we're poor. We're covetous because we're poor. And we rob because we're poor. And we run after the people, those rich people. They are taking things that do not belong to them. That's why we destroy their lives and destroy their families so we can have something. We are poor and sinful. Yes, we know. And we're going to get to heaven because God knows our condition. It's not the poor and the sinful. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. What then does it mean? I've told you what it does not mean. It does not mean you are poor in society, therefore you are going to heaven. It does not mean you are poor in social status, therefore you are going to heaven. You are poor in substance, therefore you are going to heaven. No, it doesn't work that way. You are poor and you are in slavery, servitude, therefore you are going to heaven. It doesn't work that way. You are poor and you are sickly, therefore you are going to heaven. It doesn't work that way. Poor and sensual, poor and sinful, that's not what it means. What does it mean then to be poor 
in spirit. Poor in spirit. It means you have poverty in your spirit. Poverty in your soul. It's an internal sin. It's not an external sin. You understand? Poor in society, that's external. Poor in status, that's external. You are poor in substance, that's external. You are poor in slavery, that's external. You are poor and sickly, that's external. Or you are poor and you are sensual, that's all external. You are poor and sinful or selfish, that's all external. We're talking about something internal in your soul, in your spirit. Poor in spirit. Look at the word of God in Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. And we're reading there from verse 2. And the word, when you read scripture, you compare scriptures. And these scriptures interpret one another. In Isaiah chapter 66 verse 2. For all these things as mine hand made. And all those things have been, says the Lord. But to this man will I look. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit. And trembleth at my word. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. You are contrite in heart. You are subdued in the heart. You are humiliated and humbled in the heart. You are sorrowful in the heart. You are submissive in the heart. Contrite spirit and it trembles at my word. When you hear about the judgment of God and when you hear about what God is going to do on the final day to those who remain adamant in their sinners, you tremble and say, Lord, I don't want a judgment upon me. Those are the people that are poor in spirit. And then we're told in, um, in Isaiah chapter 57, Isaiah 57 verse 15. For thus says the high and the lowly one that inhabiteth in eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. Contrite and humble spirit. Now you begin to understand what it means to be poor in spirit. It means you are contrite. You are convicted of sin. And you don't hide it. And the word of God comes to you. Maybe it's coming directly from Christ. Maybe it's coming directly from any of the disciples of Christ. And then it strikes you and knocks at your bosom sin. At the things you have done that God has a controversy with you. And you say, yes, I understand. I'm convicted. I'm condemned because of my sin. And then you bend low in the sight of the Lord. And then you repent of your sin. Turning away from your sin. It says, those that have contrite spirit, humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble. And to revive the heart of the contrite ones. In uh, uh, Psalm 49. This tells us another part of what it means to be poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit. And when you say somebody is poor, ordinarily that means he cannot buy the necessities of life. Oh, you say, why are not your children going to school? Well, I cannot afford it because I'm poor. Why is it you don't have a good accommodation? I cannot afford that because I'm poor. Why is it you don't have some necessities of life? That's what I'm telling you. I am poor. Those who are poor, they can tell you it means they do not have sufficient to buy the necessities of life. What's Jesus talking about? He's talking about the kingdom of God. How do we get to the kingdom of God? Through righteousness. If you have enough righteousness, then you'll be able to get to the kingdom of God. Therefore, the price we pay and the price of getting to the kingdom of God is righteousness. Do we have enough righteousness by ourselves to be able to get to the kingdom of God? The answer is no. Therefore, we know it's a necessity to get to the kingdom of God. And what it takes to get to that kingdom, you don't have, I don't have, you don't have by yourself, I don't have by myself. Therefore, because we don't have what it takes to get into the kingdom of God, that means we're poor spiritually. You are poor spiritually, you are poor in spirit. Now look at Psalm 49. In Psalm 49, we're reading from verse 6. They that trust in their wells and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. 
you understand then, it's telling us nobody has sufficient to be able to pay for the salvation, for the redemption, for the ransom, for the forgiveness of his fellow man or even for himself. And because you don't have enough to be able to pay for salvation, then you are poor. You don't have enough to be able to get the salvation of the Lord when you realize it. You accept it. You acknowledge it. You confess it. That means you are poor in spirit. Revelation chapter 3. I said you must realize it. You must acknowledge it. You must accept it. And you must confess it before the Lord. If you are poor but you, are, you don't acknowledge it. If you cannot pay for your salvation but you don't acknowledge it. You don't accept it. And you don't seek the salvation that comes from the Lord. And from the Lord alone. Then you are not poor in spirit. Let me show you an example. Revelation chapter 3 verse 17. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 17. Because thou sayest I am rich. And increase with goods. And have need of nothing. Because this is what you are saying. You don't accept. You don't have anything to pay for your redemption. You don't have anything to pay for your salvation. You don't have anything to pay to be able to get to heaven. Because you are not acknowledging it. And you say, I am rich. And increase with goods. And have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched. And miserable. And poor. And blind. And naked. You see these uh, people there, the Laodiceans. You know why they said they had enough? Well, they had enough material things. Not only that, they belong to a particular church denomination. And they felt, we go to church, we read the Bible, and we're all right, and we have material things too. If God didn't have, uh, have favor on us, why do we have all these material things? Have you found some people like that? They're not born again. They don't have victory over sin. And then they're going to a particular church. And then in that church, maybe the Lord has blessed them. But you understand? He gives us rain and sunshine to the just and to the unjust. He gives us breath and we breathe. He gives us strength. He gives us health. That's God. That's what he does. So that nobody will be able to say on the other, on that day, you didn't give me all that I needed. But he gives us material things that we enjoy. Because of that, there are people that say, we're rich. We're wealthy. We have everything made. And because we have everything made, and we go to church too, we're not idol worshippers. We have enough. And yet you are not free from sin. You're not born again. You're not a child of God. That's what Jesus is saying here. Because thou sayest, I am rich. Increase with goods. And have need of nothing. You don't need salvation. I have need of nothing. You don't need holiness, sanctification. I have need of nothing. You don't need freedom from sin, a ticket that gets you to heaven. I have need of nothing. Is there anybody there at the Bible study tonight? Your conscience tells you you are not born again. You are not a child of God yet. The Spirit of God is not bearing witness with your heart that your sins are forgiven, that you are totally free. But you have some little, little things, a car to ride, a house to live in and then we're prayed for you you've got married and you've got children and you are thinking because i've got all these material blessings then i'm all right no you're not all right yet you realize you acknowledge you accept and then you confess that you are wretched that you are miserable that you are poor and that you need the salvation of the lord that's what jesus said in verse 18 i counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire this is not the gold you put in your ear. This is the one you get from Christ. Because you know, as, as soon as, it was wonderful. Buy gold. Ah, you buy this one from Christ. And you don't find Christ in the supermarket. You don't buy, find Christ in a grocery store. You don't find Christ in all the places you bought the gold in your ear. This one is talking of something spiritual. Buy of me by prayer. By faith, by repentance, by turning unto the Lord, and by holding unto the grace of God. Buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. Here we come again, buy of me white clothes, that you may be clothed. And what's that talking about? Maybe you are there, you are going to a white garment church. As soon as I read that, then your eyes got big and open. You we'll say, wonderful. It's good to come to this Bible study. I'm just putting on my white garment. I didn't know that it was in the Bible. No, not the one you're putting on. Because that one, you didn't get that from Christ. You got that from even a sinful tailor. Didn't you see those tailors that sold those white garments for us? 
us. You know, they smoke and they drink and they do evil things. That's not the white garment we're talking about. He said, buy of me. You buy from the Lord. This is talking about purity. Wash me. I shall be whiter than snow. It's talking about salvation. It's talking about righteousness. Buy of me. Go try it in the fire that you may be spiritually rich. And then buy of me clothes, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes serve. Now you understand, it's not only about the oil in the bottle, you get this one from Christ. It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit he's talking about now. And then it says, that thou mayest see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door. And knock, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And then he'll give you his salvation. You'll have it in Jesus' name. It's, taking, it's telling us then about uh, the kind, about the humility we ought to have and about the poverty of spirit we ought to have. In Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 3 and reading from verse 4. Matthew chapter 18 from verse 3. And he said, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children. Except ye be converted and become as little children. What do you know of little children? Little children know that they have nothing. Nothing. They have nothing. That they depend only upon the love of the father and the mother to be able to provide all that they need. The same thing when you are poor in spirit, you have nothing. You only depend upon the almighty God, upon the Lord Jesus Christ to supply everything you need for salvation. Everything you need to be able to get to heaven. That's why Jesus said, except you are poor in spirit, except you are as humble as a little child. Knowing that you have nothing to pay for your salvation, except that ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself. Look up here. You see what it says here? Shall humble himself. I read of a preacher was a preaching and he said there was a man in his church. Every time he will come to his church and say, God humble me, God humble me, God humble me. And then the preacher went to him and said, don't pray like that. You humble yourself. If God humbles you, you want him to deal with you like Pharaoh. God humbled Pharaoh. If God humbles you, you want him to deal with you like Nebuchadnezzar. God humbled Nebuchadnezzar. If God humbles you, you want him to deal with you like Goliath. He humbled him. If God humbles you, you want him to deal with you like Herod. God humbled Herod. Humble yourself. Don't wait for God to do. When God humbles a man, that one is judgment. That's judgment. He therefore that will humble himself. You come before the Lord. And it's you that will come down from the high tower where you are, where you say, I have everything. I can pay for my salvation. I can pay for everything I need. I don't need Christ. Come down from that and repent and turn away from that. And now humble yourself. It says, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven in james chapter 4 james chapter 4 i'm reading to you from verse 6 james chapter 4 verse 6 here it says but he giveth more grace wherefore he says god resisteth the proud but giveth grace to the humble the grace to be saved he gives to the humble the grace to overcome temptation, he gives to the humble. And the grace to live a victorious life, he gives to the humble. The humble, they're the people that beg. They're the people that ask the Lord. They're the people that say, Lord, I don't have enough. No strength of my own. No power of my own. No victory of my own. I need the power and the strength and the spiritual life from you. You beg for it. That's the position of a poor man. Of a person that is poor in spirit. Look at verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh unto God. And he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. And your joy to heaviness. What's verse 10? Read it out. Let me hear you.
Thank you very much. You know, you know what I was telling you? This man that told me, Lord, humble me, Lord, humble me, Lord, humble me. You know, there's some people, if you find that they are proud and they're lifted up, and then you ask them, why is it you are so proud? What do you have? Why are you, why are you so proud? And you are not listening to the word of God, and you are not born again. He says, I've been praying that God will humble me. God has not answered. When God answers, you'll see that humility in me. I'm sincere. I'm talking unto God and I'm telling God, humble me, humble me. No, that's not the way. You do it yourself. You come down yourself. You think about it. What do I have? What do I know? Where have I been? Where have I gone? What do I possess? I need salvation. I need the grace of God in my life. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. These are the poor in spirit. And these poor in spirit, the Lord will give everything that we need from salvation to holiness to everything to get to the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Now we come to point number two. Merciful promise for the poor in spirit. Merciful promise for the poor in spirit. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 again. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here Jesus Christ said there is a promise that is given to those who are poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And let's understand that this is the promise the Lord had been given from Old Testament time. That if we're going to have the kingdom of God, the favor of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God in our lives, he wants us to bend down, to bow low, and then to be humble in his sight. In Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15, Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15, for thus says the high and the lofty one. You see that one, that's with a capital O, it's talking about the almighty God. Here it says, thus says the high and the holy one, the lofty one, that inhabited eternity. One, and then it says, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. With him also that's of a contrite and humble spirit. When, if somebody is proud in spirit, the Lord pushes him away. It says you don't have the right attitude to be able to come to the presence of God. Anything you are seeking from the Lord, if you are going to get an answer from the Lord, he wants you to be lowly and he wants you to, uh, to come with the actual Lord. I don't have anything. Uh, do you remember the prayer of that Pharisee? That is uh, the fellow that came to the presence of God. He wanted to pray. And when he came to the presence of God, there was no poverty of spirit. There was no humility at all. In Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, I'm reading to you from verse 9. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. They didn't trust in the Lord. They trusted in themselves. They projected themselves. They had confidence in themselves. Instead of having faith in God, they had faith in themselves. Instead of having confidence in God, they had confidence in themselves. And there are people that do that, you know, they build up self. They say, I want self-assertion, self-confidence, self-esteem. Anywhere I am, when I stand, I want the people to know who I am. No, let the people know who God is. How great, gracious the almighty God is. That you will be nothing but for the grace of God. You see this man in verse 9. He, he trusted in, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. Verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Do you see that? The Pharisee stood and he prayed thus with himself. He was so full of self. And when he stood in the presence of God and he wanted to pray, all he could think about is achievement. It's religious achievement and accomplishment. And he thinks he had done for God. Not what God had done for him, what he had done for God. What he had given to God. What, not what God had given to him, what he had given to God. 
the sacrifice he had made on behalf of God. Not the sacrifice that God made on his behalf. You see what I'm talking about? The people that are proud in spirit. The people, they come before the Lord and they say they are praying. They see the way he prayed the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee. That I am not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. He began to make comparison, carnal comparison. I'm better than they all. I'm higher than they all. I'm more righteous than they all. Are there people here tonight that pray like that when you come before God? And you do not see any area where you need the grace of God. All the prayer is, oh God, I thank you. All this is they are preaching and talking about. About this and that. I thank you, Lord. I am not like that. I am so strong. And I am so great. And I am so mighty. And nobody can accuse me of this or that. Because I am such and such. That's a Pharisee. And then he said, look at it now, the next verse, what he says in verse 12, I fast twice in the week. Uh, have you met some people like this? Yeah, they, they want to just show you how spiritual they are. There's no humility. There's no poverty of spirit. And then you, you ask them, hey, would you please uh, come with us to church? We're having some special programs in our church at this time. And I see that you, you know, I see the Bible with you every time. Why don't you come with us? And then they say, which church are you inviting me to? And then you say, it's a deeper life Bible church. Oh, he says, yes, I've heard about that church. They read the Bible. But the way you are, do you fast at all? Oh, you say, that's between me and God. So that's what you are. You, you don't want to tell me you are not fasting. That's why you say, it's between you and God. For me, I, you know, I will tell you, I fast twice in the week. In fact, sometimes I double it. Four times in the week, I fast. Have you fasted seven days before? Have you fasted um, 21 days before? Uh, you say, well, I, I don't want to talk about that. Well, I will talk about my own by the grace of God. You know, I'm so strong and powerful. I fasted 21 days. In fact, once in three months, I must do it. There you are. So proud of what they think is spirituality. And yet it is nothing in the sight of God. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. And he smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. That's being poor in spirit. He realized if he was going to get anything from God, it would be on the mercy of God, the love of God, the grace of God. Be merciful unto me, a sinner. Do you see this publican? He did not refer to the, um, to the, um, to the Pharisee. He did not refer to any other person. I'm better than this. I'm better than that. I'm better than that. He just said, this is me before you, O God. I cannot even look up. I'm not free to be in your presence. Be merciful unto me, a sinner. If you may come in here for many, many years and you have not been born again, this is a problem. You have a lot of Bible verses in your head. And then you can rant out, you can, you know, shout out all those Bible verses. And when you meet other people, you know, you demonstrate how much of the Bible you know. And it's all pride. It's all pride. Everything you know in the Bible, everything you know in the Christian faith makes you pumped up, makes you to become more proud. But when you come before the Lord and before other people and you are willing to acknowledge that you have nothing, that you know nothing, and then you bend low by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, oh Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. That's how you get saved. And then you are able to tell the Lord, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I clinch. Could my tears forever flow. And my zeal no respite, no all these for sin cannot atone. Thou and thou alone must save. That's what the man was saying. I need your mercy so that I can, I can have the salvation of the Lord. See what Jesus said at the end of it. For Then he says in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. This publican that begged, that pleaded for the mercy of God, he went to his house justified rather than the other man, rather than the proud, self-centered Pharisee. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth 
himself. It's not God humbling you. You have to do it yourself. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. And see what some examples in the Old Testament. In Second Chronicles chapter 12. Second Chronicles. I'm reading from chapter 12. Verse 6. And verse 7. Second Chronicles chapter 12. Reading from verse 6. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves. Can I emphasize it to you again? Not God humbling them. They humbled themselves. You know, if you are proud, maybe that's your, that's, that's your peculiar problem. Now, whatever little thing you accomplish, whatever little thing you do, you want to, you know, publicize it. Exalt yourself. And it appears that you, know, you are looking for somebody. Have you heard? Have you heard what I did? Have you heard who I am now? Have you heard what I've accomplished? What I've achieved? If that's yourself, if that's you, you humble yourself in the sight of God so that the Lord will be able to lift you up. In that verse 6, it says that these people, the king and the princes, what they did is they humbled themselves and they said, The Lord is righteous in verse 7 and when the lord saw that they humbled themselves not when the lord saw that they waited for him to humble them when the lord saw that they humbled themselves then it says the word of the lord came to shemaiah saying they have humbled themselves therefore i will not destroy them but i will grant them some deliverance and my wrath shall not be poured out upon jerusalem by the hand of shashak and that's the blessing of the lord upon the people who humble themselves we're looking at uh, second chronicles chapter 33 Second Chronicles chapter 33, reading from verse 12 and reading from verse 13. Second Chronicles 33, verse 12. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself. Why have we missed this so long? That if there's going to be any poverty of spirit, we have to do it ourselves. If there's, any, if there's going to be any humbleness of mind, we're going to do it ourselves. Do you see over and over as we're reading, when he humbled himself before the God of his fathers, and he prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. We're coming to Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. We're reading from verse 14. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves. You know, it's there every time. Every time he talks about we being humble, he says we do it ourselves. We do it ourselves. It is the sinner that will humble himself before the Lord. It's the backslider that will humble himself before the Lord. It's even the child of God, the child of God, who is saved by the grace of God and is living a victorious life by the grace of God. And God requires us to be humble. And we are the people that will humble ourselves. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And that's what the Lord is telling us. He says, that is what we need. It tells us in Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. You see, when we humble ourselves, there is a promise that he has given unto us. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4. By humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. By humility and the fear of the Lord. When we humble ourselves and we have the fear of God, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And then it makes us to depart from the ways of evil. When you humble yourself, you are saying, God, I've been wrong. If you are sincere about that confession, I've been wrong. You don't want to go in that wrong direction anymore. And then it says through that you'll have eternal life. 
And through that, you'll have honor, which is praise from the Lord. And through that, you'll also have riches, which means abundant blessings of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23. A man's pride shall bring him low. A man's pride shall bring him low. Now, again, let's understand, uh, there are people that will think that it's others that have brought them low. You know, they will say, hey, nobody loves me. I heard about a man that, uh, you know, he didn't want to go to school. And, and this man is actually the principal of a, of a particular school. He says, nobody in that school loves me. No, even the students they don't love me, and the teachers they don't love me. Nobody loves me in that school. And then was staying at home, not wanting to go to school anymore because he says I'm rejected, and because I'm rejected, I'm dejected. And and he was the principal. He could easily make a change in that school, and he could go to the people, go to the staff, me and say, members of staff, let's talk, let's talk together. I know that I've not uh, done right. I, I've offended you people, and therefore let's forgive and let's forget the past and let's move on. And he could come to the assembly of that uh, school and talk to the children, to the young people. Children, your students here. I understand the way I've been dealing with you as the principal of this school. I know things are not right, and now we're going to set everything right. Young people, are you willing to forgive and forget? Those young people will say yes, and they'll be so glad that the principal came so low and came so humble instead of just running away from the school. You see, there are people they don't understand. They are the people that bring themselves low. If you want to bring yourself up, you humble yourself in the sight of God and in the sight of the people, and things will change. Look at that verse 23 again, 29, 23 Proverbs. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit the humble in spirit that's the poor in spirit honor shall uphold shall exalt shall lift up the humble in spirit uh, we're looking at uh, the new testament that's in luke chapter 15 here is uh, the prodigal son the prodigal son had gone to a far country and then he was suffering there eventually it says in verse 17 and when he came to himself how do you understand that? When he came to his senses. How do you understand that? When he understood, well, my rebellion is not causing suffering for my father. It's causing suffering for me. I'm bringing myself low. See my condition here. Why should I be like this? And then he says, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. That's, a, that's being poor in spirit. I'm going to swallow my pride. I'm going to just forget all the pride I had when I left home. And I'm going back to my father and I'm going to tell my father how it is. I'm not going to be proud at all this time. And I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned. It's not a long sentence. You know, when somebody is humble before God, it doesn't have to be a long, long prayer. Just, I have sinned. Do you remember David? David was the man that committed adultery. And even killed the husband of that woman. And then the, husband, the woman became pregnant. The woman was pregnant. And eventually the child was born. And the child was saved. And David still did not realize. He was saying, I am the king. And I know how to pray. I've written many psalms. And I'm going to pray to God. I don't want that child to die. I'm a man of faith. A man of psalms. And then he prayed and prayed and the child died. Then he wiped up all the tears and then rose up and ate. But still had not repented. And then eventually Nathan came to him and Nathan confronted the king. And you think about a king in those days. A king in those days could just say, cut his head off, kill him, get rid of him, vanish from here. I don't want to see you anymore. A king could do that. But then Nathan said, oh king, there's somebody here. Yes, how about it? This fellow arch just uh, had a, a lot of uh, lambs. And then they was talking. And this other person just one ewe lamb, a little lamb. And this rich man took that ewe lamb, killed it, and served as a visitor. And David said, what? In this kingdom, that fellow must die. And then he'll pay back fourfold before I even kill him. And then Nathan said, David, king, thou art the man. 
you are an adulterer. How many of us will be humble before Nathan at such a time that he has found you out? Or shall we argue me? I know you are a prophet, but this time you missed it. You are telling me that I committed adultery. There are people that will tell lies to save their face. My wife must not hear this one. And my friends must not hear this one. The people in my kingdom must not hear this one. Nathan, how come that you come to me to tell me something like that? There's nothing like that. But you know, David did not do that. He humbled himself and he said, I have sinned. How many words? Just three words. Doesn't take time. Just that humility. And then God said, all right, your sins are forgiven. Look at this prodigal son. This is the humility we are talking about in the sight of God. Those who have been coming for a long time, you have not been born again. This is all it takes for you to bend low. And then between you and God, tonight, and for you to say, blessed are the poor in spirit. This is the only condition God is requesting from me. I'm going to confess to the Lord. You don't come and confess to me. I'm not asking you to come to me. I'm saying you go to God in prayer. And you tell God, oh Lord, I have sinned. This is where I have gone. This is what I've done. Nobody knows it, but I know it. My conscience is telling me, Lord, I have sinned. And it's so simple like that. And God will forgive your sin. There's salvation here tonight. I said there's salvation tonight. And then he said, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I'm no more worthy. That's the humility. That's me poor in spirit. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Make me as one of thy hired servants. You know what he's saying? I don't merit anything. That's being poor in spirit. I don't merit anything. That's being poor in spirit. You know, my dear brother, maybe you are, uh, you know, a great leader in the church, uh, overseers, pardon me, I just want to use this as an example. I respect you and love you, but let me preach. You know, sometimes where you're a region overseer, and then you've done something wrong, and then you were stopped. And now as you are coming back, uh, you say, well, uh, I thank God. God is a merciful God. Of course, He's a merciful God, a loving God, a gracious God, a forgiving God. Who is a pardoning God like this? And now your sins are forgiven. And then after you are forgiven, then let's say you write a letter to me. And then you write to say, Pastor, I thank God. That thing that was reported to you, yes, it's true. I did that thing. But now God has forgiven me. And since God has forgiven me, Pastor, what's the church looking at? Why have you not also lifted the discipline? Because I am full of matter. After God has forgiven me, now I can preach. And uh, I was region overseer before. Why can't I be a state overseer now? That, the prodigal son didn't say that. He didn't say that. He said, I am no more worthy to be even in the position I was before. Make me one of the hired servants. I'll gladly go out with them to the farm and cut whatever I need to cut. I'll be a servant now. He made himself low. It was when he did that, the father said, no, you are still my son. And brought him to the same position he was before. You see what the Lord is talking about? It's when we're poor in spirit and we're not arrogating a lot to ourselves. I am this, I'm this. Yes, I see who has never seen before. It's only the discovered mind. That's why they disciplined me. All the other people sitting down there, they have not disciplined. Are they better than me? Don't talk like that. Because that's pride. It is when we are humble and we are lowly in spirit, that's when the Lord will give us even higher position than we ever had before. I pray he'll do it in Jesus' name. And so he tells us in verse 20, and he arose and he came to his father. And he arose and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto his father, I have sinned. He didn't change what he wanted to say. And that is all that God requires. You know, some people, you hear them, they are praying for salvation and they are beating the bench. Oh, God save me. Oh, God save me. Say another thing. Tell him you have sinned. Tell him that you have gone astray. Tell him what you have done. Salvation is not that difficult. Salvation is very easy to get. It's because many, many people are not praying sincerely. That's why they are not saved. 
That's why you see you are coming here for such a long time. I'm not talking to those of you who are saved. Thank God for your salvation. I mean those who have been coming for a long time and they don't have salvation. They don't have assurance that if they died after coming to a church like this for three, four years, they don't have assurance that when they die, they'll get to heaven. But you know, when you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I have sinned. I'm not a good person. I'm a bad person. This is what I've done. This is what I've done. Lord, please forgive me. I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. You'll find that the salvation, the joy of salvation will come just like that. And then we're told, the son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring in his hand and his shoes on his feet and bring hither fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again you see the tense there was in the past he was dead but he's no more dead he's alive again he was lost in the past but he's found and they began to be merry the mercy of the lord is available and the Lord will save as many as will call upon the Lord in Jesus' name. In Job chapter 22. Job chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 21. Job chapter 22. Reading from verse 21. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. If thou return unto the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of offer as the stones of the brooks. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. For then thou shalt have delight in the Almighty, and shalt lift up thy face unto God. Then thou shalt Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. The light shall shine upon thy ways when men are cast down. Thou shalt say, there is lifting up, and it shall save the humble person. Not the proud person, it shall save the humble person. Let's come to point number three now. In point number three, we're looking at the matchless provision for the poor. Matchless provision for the poor in spirit. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're reading from verse 3. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. 417 from that time jesus began to preach and to say repent for the kingdom of god is at hand when you compare those two verses how do you understand that blessed are the poor in spirit theirs is the kingdom of heaven repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand which means that if you're poor in spirit you'll not hold on to your sin if you're poor in spirit you'll not hold on to your iniquity if you're poor in spirit, you'll not hold on to your wickedness. You will repent. You will turn. That's what will show the Lord. You are actually humble and you are poor in spirit. In James chapter 2, James chapter 2, reading from verse 5. Hacking, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? You see, when you are poor in spirit, the Lord will grant you faith. By grace are ye saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God will grant you the faith to be saved when you are humble, when you are poor in spirit. And then it says, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him. The kingdom becomes yours when you are poor in spirit. In Colossians chapter 1, you are translated from the kingdom of darkness. You are translated of the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Who has delivered us. 
from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins we have forgiveness of sins what do we need then so that we can have this kingdom of god i come back to matthew chapter 5 verse 3 matthew 5 verse 3 blessed are the poor in spirit there are two kinds of people if you look at the whole world you can divide the whole world into two if you look at any group of people like my congregation here tonight you can divide us into two you see poor in spirit go to this side proud in spirit go to this side those are the only two groups in the world either you are poor in spirit or you are proud in spirit if you are poor in spirit, you inherit the kingdom of God. You enter into the kingdom of God. If you are proud in spirit, you are denied the kingdom of God. How do we know which camp we belong to? Number one, the poor in spirit is humble. The proud in spirit is haughty and high-minded. And you can tell which one you are. You don't need a policeman to come to you and say, you are poor in spirit or you are proud in spirit. You can tell for yourself, are you humble before God? Are you lowly before God? You bend before God? You say, oh God, I raise up my hands, I surrender to you. You are the almighty God. I am nothing. I'm like a little ant. And it's only that you are, you are merciful. That's why you have not judged me. I merit your judgment. That's being humble, poor in spirit. But if you are haughty and high-minded, that means you are proud in spirit. And you will be denied the kingdom of God. Number two, the poor in spirit is contrite and penitent. The poor in spirit is contrite and penitent. There is conviction inside your heart. I feel guilty. I feel condemned. I'm not done right in the sight of God. God knows my heart. God is holy. I am unrighteous. You are contrite and penitent. You are sorrowful because of your sin. The proud in spirit is conceited and proud. To be conceited means to be full of himself. He has a high, great, exalted value of himself. Proud in spirit, you are conceited and proud. Which group do you belong to? If you're going to have the kingdom of God, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are contrite and penitent, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Number three, uh, the poor in spirit, they have true confession of sin. The poor in spirit have true confession of sin. I've shown you about David. Yes, I have sinned. True confession. And then about the prodigal son, Lord, I know myself, my father, I have sinned against you. That's true confession, poor in spirit. I about the proud in spirit, false confession of sin. False confession of sin. You remember Pharaoh telling Moses, ah, Moses, I have sinned. I know that I've seen this time. And then the next day, he has changed his mind. Do you remember Balaam when the angel met him? And then he said, oh, angel, I didn't know you were there. I didn't know that's why my ass was turning this one, turning that way. I have seen. But if you don't want me to go, I will not. He still wanted to go. Do you remember, uh, you know, Saul, that is the first king of Israel, when Samuel con confronted him, what is this that you have done? Why have you done this? When you were humble and lowly in your own sight, didn't the Lord choose you to be king over his people? Why have you done this? Oh, you know, it's, it's not me. It's the people that they have chosen the good, uh, the, the good sheep, and then we have killed all the others. It's not me, it's the people. Do you, you see that kind of confession? And then eventually it's okay, I have sinned, but glorify me before the people. Honor me before the people. I'm still king. Show me respect now. And someone said, I'm not going to show any respect because God has rejected you. You see, when somebody is proud in spirit, although you make confession, but it's a forced confession, they force you to do it. Tell me, did you do this sin? Then you keep quiet. Talk now. Did you actually do this sin? Then you look here and there. Okay, uh, if you don't want the other people to be around, your brethren, uh, his wife, please go. You wait for your husband outside. Did you do this sin? Pastor, I did. How is it? How did you do it? Pastor, God is a loving God. Yes, I, 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 I sinned. I, I did it. Force. They force you to do it. That's not confession. But when from your, the depths of your heart, you come before God, what am I hiding? If they don't know it here, they'll know it up there. 
then it will be too late. I'm sorry I have sinned. You see, that poverty of spirit, that humility of heart, that's what God is looking for. Not when they bring you out like Achan. Achan, what have you done? Tell me, glorify the Lord. Tell me what you have done. Not that kind of Achan confession. Achan's confession. Number four, condemnation of self for sin and suffering. Condemn, you condemn yourself that I'm the one that did this. Anything I'm suffering, any punishment on me, any reverses of life, it is me. I am guilty. Conf condemnation of self for sin and suffering. How about those who are proud in spirit? Condemnation of others for their sin and suffering. It's my wife that brought this upon me. It's my husband that brought this upon me. It's uh, my brethren in the church that brought this upon me. It's uh, so and so reported me that brought this upon me. Those who, have, uh, those who are proud in spirit, they have condemnation of others for their sin and for suffering. Number five, those who are poor in spirit, they have sincere exposure of themselves before God and man. Sincere, honest exposure of themselves before God and man. Those who are proud in spirit, number five, they have hypocritical covering up before God and man. Hypocritical covering up before God and man. I remember some years ago, a brother that I respected and loved very much, he was here in Lagos with us at that time, he's no more in Lagos now. Uh, one of the ladies reported to a zonal leader at that time and they said that this uh, person, area leader at that time, wanted to commit sin with her and actually Rofandolda would have committed sin and raped her. And uh, so the report was brought to me. And uh, so I said, uh, my brother, how is it we're hearing about this, about you? That this lady said you wanted to commit sin with her. And she said, he said, Pastor, you know me. Look at this lady. You don't know her. I know her. She has a demonic spirit. She has evil spirit. And we're trying to cast out the evil spirit from her in the district. I said, no, my brother. This lady doesn't have evil spirit. You wanted to commit sin with her. I said, no, pastor. I said, but it's true. It's okay, pastor. If you don't believe me, I've told you what I can tell you. Then he went away. Then I disciplined him. Six months after that, I called him. I said, my brother, let us talk truth. You wanted to commit sin. He said, I told you, Pastor, me? Never. I said, okay, you can go. After one year, I called him. I said, my friend, this sin is evil. This is bad. You wanted to. He said, no. I told you what I could tell you. After three years, you know, sometimes you'll find, you're, why is the pastor so tough and hard like this? Why is the pastor acting like he's acting? I led that man in discipline for three years. If he's at the Bible study, his location now is hearing me. After three years, he came to me and said, Pastor, I'm sorry, it's true, I did that thing. I said, why didn't you tell me? Three years have gone already. Why didn't you tell me at that time? You see, there are people, they're not going to expose themselves hypocritically. They will cover up before God and man. That's why it's good to be poor in spirit and say, God, I know I'm wrong. Now, already, what has happened has happened. If you have committed sin, it has happened already. The water will pour on the ground. We cannot collect it again. And the egg that is broken on the ground, there's nothing. We cannot collect it back again and make it a whole leg, a whole egg. It has happened. It has happened. What can now repair the situation is for you to come before God and say, God, I am sorry. I have sinned. Forgive me. And God will forgive in Jesus' name. Number six, uh, those who are poor in spirit, relying only on the Lord for salvation. Relying only on the Lord for salvation. Those are the poor, that, those are the people that are poor in spirit. Number, uh, then number six, those who are proud in spirit, relying on themselves for salvation. My good works, my church membership, I pay tithes and offering, I do this and that. They rely on themselves for salvation. Number seven, those who are poor in spirit, they plead for mercy like the publican. Lord, I am not worthy. I'm not a good person. I'm not a great person. But Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. You saved the thief on the cross. Lord, you will save me. You said whosoever comes to you, you will in no wise cast out. I come to you today. Save me and you'll be saved. You plead for mercy like the publican. How about the proud in spirit? They, they pray on their marriage like the Pharisee. 
Lord, look at who I am and what I have done and what I achieved. The Lord is telling us tonight, uh, being proud in spirit will not get us anywhere in the sight of the Lord. What the Lord requires is that we'll be poor in spirit. Blessed, happy, fortunate, favored, are the poor in spirit. This is the kingdom of heaven. We're going to rise up now and we're going to quietly and personally pray before the Lord. It's between you and God. It's between me and God that we're going to call on the Lord, one and all, each of us, humble in the sight of the Lord. We don't have anything. We're nothing in the sight of God. God is all in all, but we are nothing. And then just between you and God, maybe quietly between you and God, oh God, I'm sorry. That's all God is looking for. Oh God, this is where I've gone. This is what I've done. This is where I've been. That's all that God is looking for. And God will forgive. And God will forgive. He's a gracious God. And he's a merciful God. Whatever the sin, he has forgiven other people. Look at David. Look at David. Look at what David did. You have not done perhaps much as much as David has done. He committed adultery. And then he killed the husband. And then he tried to even, he didn't talk about it for almost one year. When the prophet came, the night or the time he had the word of God, he said, Lord, I am the fellow. I am wrong. Please forgive me. And God forgave him. Look at Peter. Peter denied the Lord. And he said, I never knew Jesus. He even cursed and said, if I ever knew him, he put a curse himself. And then Jesus just looked back at him and he wept like a baby. That's being contrite in heart. That's being humble. That's being poor in spirit. Oh Lord, I am the guilty one. Please forgive me. Jesus died for me. Don't let me perish. Oh Lord, help me. You, I know you love me. And I know you will not allow me to perish. Lord, mercy is what I'm asking for. I don't merit anything. Nobody merits salvation. I just come for your mercy. Forgive me and the Lord will forgive you and the joy of salvation will be your inheritance tonight.